about five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommate that even the drug dealers in the city were polite. But all of that changed in just a few minutes of one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between one and two in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrol park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a week night, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a short side street in order to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man, dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, he did straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild, head tilted back slightly, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glanced back and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again, but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments I felt relieved until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked that I stood there for some time, staring at him, and then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoed steps, as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say, at this point I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or my cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there completely frozen as the smiling man crept toward me. And then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, what the fuck do you want, in an angry, commanding tone? What came out was a whimper. What the foo? Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around very slowly and started dance walking away, just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger. He was coming back my way, and this time he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off of the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that night, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk, he didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane, and that's a very, very scary thing to see.
We'd all known Dennis had less than a week, and we'd all braced ourselves for all the good that would do. This was going to tear us apart and leave a ragged, gaping hole in all our lives. But that would be it. It would fit within our understanding of things, and we could all assume he went wherever we thought people go. That would have been so much easier, so much less troubling than what actually happened. Dennis had been diagnosed with cancer a couple of days after his 10th birthday, and it was all downhill from there. There was never an upswing, never an opportunity for surgery. All the scans showed the same thing, the oily black webs having grown larger and denser, the fact that we were twins and had looked identical right up to when he started chemo just made it worse. There I was, right beside him, a perfect image of what he used to be before his hair fell out and his color drained and his cheeks sunk down into his skull. An emaciated ghost constantly contrasted with what he should be. And then finally, the doctor shut the case, snuffed out the last wisps of hope. Dennis will most likely not last more than four days, a week at the most. So we'd all set up camp in his musty room at the hospital. The walls were freckled and pea green. The only light slanted in from between the shutters, glaring bars stretching out across the floor to end just short of Dennis's bed. The staff managed to bring in another, simpler bed for me, and my parents slept in old wicker chairs. Dennis looked really bad at this stage. You could as good as see his skull. We all wanted to talk to him, to make the most of whatever time was left. But he slept for most of the day, and when he woke up, there'd just be silence. Nobody knew what to say, there were no right words, and there was this underlying fear that the moment anybody interacted with the situation, they'd somehow make it real and it would hit everyone. The first sound would knock us all off the tightrope and we'd fall into tears and chaos and we wouldn't be able to pull ourselves back up. So there was silence, my parents occasionally forcing smiles that never made it to their eyes. The third day was when it finally happened, when the steady beeping of the heart monitor started to break down into frantic electronic wails and Dennis began to shake feebly as a dry crackling sound rose up from his mouth. My parents exploded out of their chairs, my mother heading straight to Dennis, grabbing his shoulders and pleading at him to stop it and be all right. My father was at the room door, screaming down the hallways for help. The doctors and nurses at the hospital had changed lately. They'd started treating Dennis differently. Before the resuscitations were always these frantic, desperate efforts like hundred meter sprints. There was a desperate desire to succeed in every single movement. Now it was different, more like a steady jog. These were people who were going through the motions, ticking off things they were meant to try from little checklists in their minds. I don't think it would have made a difference either way. The cancer had finally tipped over and his system just couldn't shoulder it anymore. They called it and left, offering their condolences and saying they'd take away the body when we were ready. The door clicked shut behind us, me, mom, dad, and Dennis's corpse. We all inched closer up to the side of his bed and just looked. My mother cracked breaking into great howling tears. My father pulled her close, trying to keep it together, but losing it in his own way. No sobs from him, just the occasional tear running down his face and sharp breaths bursting through his clenched teeth. I was just quietly staring at Dennis's face. We all stood there for a long time. I finally realized that this wasn't just one thing. This wasn't a single event. For the first time, my mind started running away with itself and unfolding all the endless implications of this every one of them causing my gut to sink and for me to miss him so much even though he'd just been here. I was never going to talk to him again, he was never going to laugh at me again, we were never eating dinner again, we were never going to school together again, we were never going to be in the same class in school again or talk during classes at school again. It just kept going and going as I realized that this wasn't just one person I'd lost, I'd lost a million things, something that was meant to be, this constant presence was gone, and nothing would ever be as good as it should be again. Everything I was going to do be soured by the certainty that I wouldn't be doing it with him, or that I wouldn't be able to tell him about it later. It had only ever been a childish assumption that any of that would happen. I was the first to see his lips quiver. Mom, Dad, his lips are moving. My parents froze, still clasped against each other, my mother curled over and supported by my father. We looked down as his lips continued to quiver, my parents went quiet again. They must have been trying to hold back hope, assuming it was some kind of nervous tick, but it kept going. 
and finally, in a dusty, hoarse voice, so faint it was like you were hearing it on the wind, he said my name, Harry. My father sprinted across the room, yelling for the nurses to come back. My mother was clutching her mouth and stumbling back from the bed. The workers tumbled back in and went through the checklist, and shocked him with the defibrillators a few times and reached their verdict. We're sorry, he's still dead. But I heard him talk, said my father in a small, pleading voice. Look, it could have been gas escaping, but, said my father, before a tiny scraping sound cut through the room, everyone turning towards its source. It was coming from Dennis, halfway between a sigh and a croak. Harry, it's all so dark, so cold, so dark, and it's pulling down, pulling at my insides and taking me down. A moment later, nurses started on their rounds again, but this wasn't some perfunctory run through the checklist. You could see it on their faces, in how hurried their movements were. They didn't know what was happening. They weren't even sure they were doing the right thing. They moved onto the defibrillator again, sending crashing waves of power down through Dennis' chest before listening with a stethoscope. Doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense, one was mumbling. After ten minutes, they all just stepped back. They'd run the checklist out. Nothing had happened. What's happening? My mother screamed. One of the men, a doctor, I think, answered. Nothing is happening. We try and pump in oxygen and it does nothing. There's no pulse and we can't induce one for more than a second or two. The body temperature's down three degrees. He's deceased. But we heard him. I said, I know, but he's dead. The dry grating came again and everyone shut up. Please, Harry, where are you? I walked over to his side. I wasn't relieved he was talking. I was only afraid. This was wrong. I wanted to run. I wanted him to just be gone so I could cry with my parents and be done with it. But I kept walking and put my hand on his, his bony, cold and clearly dead hand. I'm here, I said. I can see grey, a little bit of grey, but it's so far away. I don't just see it, I feel it. I feel it, and I never knew something could be so far away. I'm already so far down, but I need to go so much further to get to the grey. I didn't know how to respond, so I just stood there, stood there, and listened to him talk about the darkness and the distant grey smudge. Sometimes he'd answer me, sometimes he wouldn't. A lot of stuff happened around me in the next few hours. Everyone who worked at the hospital must have been in and out. Even my parents started to leave sometimes when they accepted I was the only one Dennis seemed to be aware of. Dennis was looked at by every type of doctor they had in there, and nobody understood. They started moving him around on a stretcher, taking him to the equipment they couldn't just bring to him. I had to come along. I was the only one who could keep him talking. It was a long time before anything was turned up. They'd gotten desperate and had put Dennis in an fMRI machine. They'd fully prepped a corpse and put it in a machine for the living. My entire family was in the room. A cold, confused fear had settled in my gut, making me feel a little bit like throwing up. I think we've got something, said the technician who was looking at the monitors. Please just tell us what's happening said my mother. She'd moved past terror and hope and was now above all else exhausted, her red face slack and empty. Look, this scan looks for where the blood is in the brain. Well, the thing is that none of the blood in the brain is moving. We know that from his pulse, but something is happening in there. Something the machine can only pick up a little, but there is some kind of activity. Now I can't be sure, but I think the activity is clustered around some of the parts that control movement. Everything else is totally dead. He's obviously conscious. He's using complete sentences, but... But what? said my father. But it's like whatever's doing, the thinking is somewhere else, still interacting with the stuff that does the talking. That's exactly right, came a voice behind us. I looked over my shoulder and saw an old man in a grey business suit. He had a well-trimmed silver beard and was all around a strange contrast to the clumsy chaos that had engulfed the hospital. Who are you? said the technician. I'm Danielle Coans, he said, handing the technician a crisp business card. I'm with the Orpheus Institute. We're a semi-private medical research body, and we've dealt with a few cases similar to this one. The hospital president has already agreed to let us look into this. Almost invisibly, a number of men had moved in behind Coan and were now making their way over to the technician. These men will help explain the confidentiality situation surrounding issues like this. We'll handle the boy from here. More men, these ones in pure white scrubs that had a strange logo on the left breast, got Dennis back on the stretcher and led us all into the hallway. We followed wordlessly, 
never thinking to say anything because at least these new people represented new possibilities, a completely new road that might lead to an explanation. They rolled Dennis into an operating theater and my mother gasped, look, just what are you doing? said my father in a husky voice that made it obvious he was still holding in tears. Kwane, who had been striding ahead of the stretcher with a speed that belied his age, had stopped once we got to theatre and was now taking deliberate care to look us all three of us in the eyes. We were still in the hallway, the operating theatre door shut beside us. He answered in a low, comfortable tone, We're not performing surgery, it's just the quietest part of the hospital, and there are no distractions in there. We want nothing more than to understand what has happened to your son. This sort of thing has happened before. Your son is conscious and, as we understand, he will only talk to his brother here. We want to use Harry to ask Dennis our questions. We believe this would work best if he and Harry were alone. We've got the theatre wired so that we can hear the answers. My parents didn't say anything for a while. My father broke the silence with weak, staggered words. Do you think he might come back? I know that even if he does, it won't be for long, but I'd really like him back for however long. I didn't say enough. I wasn't big enough to say the things we had to say to each other. If such a thing is possible, I swear, we will do everything in our power to make it happen. We've prepared a private waiting room for you too. Koans gestured down to the turn in the hallway. There were two people in the white scrub standing there. Pete and Shirley will lead you to there if you would please go with them. My parents began to shuffle down the corridor, my mother still buried in my father's side. My father kept throwing looks back over his shoulder at me like he was afraid I'd vanish. Soon they were gone, and I felt Koan's hand come down on my shoulder. I turned around to him and he knelt down, so we were closer to being level. I know this is very hard on you. I know this must be the worst day of your life, but do you think you're up to a quick history lesson? I couldn't bring myself to answer properly, but some curiosity managed to rise through the delirium and shock, and I nodded. Koanis smiled. One of the most significant moments of human history was the moon landing, and it's not even the fact itself that makes it so important, it's that we had contact with them the whole time they were up there. They were sending radio signals back to Earth and could be talked to. Do you think the moon landing would be what it was if we didn't have that kind of connection to our men as they strode the unsettling and inhospitable surface of a place we were never meant to have knowledge of? What if they'd just gone up and never came back? What if we knew for sure that they got there but had no signals from them? I was still quite out of it, so I can't say I was properly digesting all of this. I slurred out, I don't know. They didn't know if they could get the astronauts back, it was a very real possibility that they'd be left to die up there, stranded. Yet they still did it. It didn't matter if the mission was a failure. It didn't matter if there was no triumphant return. Do you know what mattered? What mattered more than anything was speaking to them while they were up there, to have that connection to three brave men in the void, describing man's first steps into the unknown. If they'd never come back, it wouldn't have changed anything, as long as we down here managed to make that connection to the beyond as long as we down here, for however long had men up there, men to describe the soil, men to explain the feeling of being so light, men to tell us what the earth looked like, cut in half by the lunar horizon, men to teach us about a new world. His hand tightened on my shoulder. None of that would have been possible without the people in Houston, without the men who talked to the astronauts, kept them focused, made sure we got the information we needed. Harry. We believe Dennis is in a very strange place, that humanity would do well to learn about it. You are Houston. Your brother is an astronaut. He pulled a laminated sheet out from under his lapel. Here's a sheet with some topics you should focus on and questions you should ask. This should help you get the most useful and needed information. But the most important thing is to keep him talking. Stop talking for five seconds and you could lose him. I accepted the card having given up on reaching a decent understanding of the situation. He ushered me into the operating theater and shut the door behind me. I was alone, the only sound an almost inaudible ringing that emanated from the mass of stainless steel racks and implements and the cold, sturdy operating table Dennis was lying on. I approached the table and, in need of any sort of guidance, I looked at the laminated sheet. General Principles Try to keep your loved one, the subject, unaware of their deceased state. Past experience suggests that the shock may cause disconnection. 
maintain constant conversation, as this has been shown to help maintain the connection. Do not ask leading questions such as whether your loved one, the subject, is having experiences in line with your own religious beliefs. First step, ask your loved one. The subject to describe their experiences and or surroundings. Encourage them to be as a gasp pulled my attention away from the sheet. Harry Dennis said, yes, it's me, I answered, grabbing his hand. There was now no doubt that he really was dead. The hand was ice cold and the fingers had locked in place at odd angles with rigor mortis. His entire body had gone from the sickly white of the dying to the rain cloud shade of the dead. I got to the gray, to the ground, came down easy like a leaf, cold. I'm standing there now. Dennis, can you describe where you are? It's still gray, but it's more real now, solid. Gray sand underneath, gray ocean behind me, gray clouds above. Don't remember going through the clouds, but they're there now. The clouds, they're screaming. An ocean, I said. Can you see anything in the ocean? Dennis took in a phlegmy, pointless breath. Far away, the horizon, it gets dark. Dark, hungry line where even clouds stop where everything stops. Darkness is clawing, moving like it's alive. Miles and miles of angry, hungry dark. Can't go there, can't go that way. At this point, I lost the thread of the exchange as perspective suddenly hit. All the things I didn't understand and the fact that whatever Dennis was, he wasn't alive. I broke, crying and wailing and digging my face into his bare, emaciated ribs, cold like meat straight out of the fridge. I kept squeezing his hand harder and harder, pushing the stiff fingers closer together. Dennis, please come back, please. Wherever you are, just get back here. Harry? Harry, are you crying? It's hard to tell. So much here already sounds like crying. His words struck me deep enough make my sobs catch in my throat, and I just started looking at him again, settling back to my previous catatonic distance from what was happening. I can't come back. No getting back. Like spilling something on the ground. No getting it all back inside and right again. It took a few seconds to force myself to accept this, but I carried on hoping that maybe I could steer him towards some sign that he was wrong. What's in the other direction, away from the ocean? That's the way I have to go. If I try and swim, the darkness will tear me up, shred away everything until only my pain is left, and it'll toss that into the clouds, into the clouds, and I'll scream. Dennis, tell me what's in the other direction. Just the sand, the grey sand on and on. Not many bad things yet, not many bad things to see yet. There'll be more when I get where I'm going. I'm going to start walking now, Harry. Where are you meant to be going? I said. I'd started digging my nails anxiously into my forearm. There was something nauseatingly, dreadfully true about everything he was saying. It was like the first time you learn the world is round, and it feels weird for a few seconds, but soon you get used to the idea, and you see it's the truth. That's the big secret, and it doesn't matter how flat the ground feels. It doesn't matter how little sense it makes, it's true and he just kept talking. I can see another person. Can you talk to them? I said, trying to keep my voice steady, feeling like I shouldn't be the one who couldn't keep it together. I suppose I could, but I can't. What do you mean? It's just not a talking kind of place. We were supposed to have done all our talking before we came here. Now we should just keep quiet. But you're talking to me, Dennis. But my voice isn't here. My voice is all the way up there with you. Dennis's, I said, now squeezing my eyes to force the tears back in. Dennis, please, tell me what's happening. I think I finally died. And what's happening now is what happens next, the thing that was always going to be happen next. It feels right in a scary way. It's been expecting me for so long, since before I was even a fuzzy little thing that might happen, since before our parents and their parents and so far back, it's been expecting me. Please stop talking like that. You don't talk like that. You never have. Sorry, you just sort of see things different here. Some things you know without ever being told. Some things you forget. I couldn't think of anything to say and started to worry, remembering that if I left the pauses too long, he could stop answering. Hey, said Dennis, and the edges of his mouth strained out, awkwardly imitating a smile. I see a few more more people, and they're all naked, but really naked. Their clothes are off and they're all grey and wrinkly, but that's not it. You can kind of see inside them, like all the walls have fallen down, and you can see who they are, all their thoughts and feelings, 
just kind of hanging around them like ghosts. It's like someone's pulled the clothes off their whole past. They're so naked, Harry. He made a light coughing sound that was meant to be a laugh. That's really scary. Oh, I thought you might have thought it was funny. I don't think we're going to laugh at the same stuff anymore. I think you're different now. I guess that makes sense. So, what are all the people doing? Most of them are moving, same direction as me, towards the center. The center of what? Hmm? It's just called the center. The center of this place may be the center of everything. But what? I said, starting to lose control. Why do you have to go? I don't have to. Nobody has to. Just like you, don't have to shake someone's hand when they put it out or answer them when they talk to you. But it would feel wrong not to. It's what you're meant to do, and there's not any other good options. You don't want to stand still. What happens when you stand still? Depends. A few days ago, I passed this woman. A few days, I said, gripping the cold steel of the operating table as I was filled with an eerie sense of vertigo. You haven't been dead for even a day. I passed her a few days ago, he said, carrying on like he hadn't heard me. She didn't reach the center. She just sat down, started going her own way. She's pulled one side of her ribcage out and it's all stretched, spreading up to her left, so high, stretching out the arm, grabbing its corner. Most of her skin started to get hard and flaky, like old wood or crumbling stone. I can see herself. Musician, liked music, kind of thought of her life like a song. Sometimes it repeated itself, some bad notes here and there, but it was pulling itself together. She was reaching the chorus, and it ended, it was over so fast, and she can't accept it. She's picked this sharp rock off the ground, and she's scraping it past her ribs like a huge harp or something, angry. Trying to make music keep the song going, but it's an awful sound. Sawing bone, and it's never going to replace what should have come next. She's already grown into the ground. She's going to be here forever, trying to make the music she missed out on. There was nothing to say to that, so I just went quiet for a while, assuming he'd keep talking. He didn't. Dennis! Dennis! No answer. A terrified jolt ran through me and I started slamming my fist onto his chest. Dennis! Come back, Dennis! A growl tore out of his mouth and his frame thrashed upwards, causing me to jump back and tumble down onto the floor, smashing into surgeon's selves and causing gleaming surgical instruments to rain down around me. I didn't have time to think before I'd forced myself up again and bent over the operating table to stare desperately into my brother's eyes. I took his hand again, squeezing it as hard as I could. Harry, he said, and relief flooded through me. It's been so long, so long it's been years, Do what? I've been walking for years, years and years, and it keeps getting worse. It hasn't been a day. It's been so many years and everything keeps getting worse. What, what's worse? It gets worse closer to the center. There's so many people now, thousands, tens of thousands, and they're all walking to the center. But what's so terrible? There's more, so many more, like the girl with the harp I told you about, stuck in place, trying to fix what happened, angry about what happened, rooted to the ground, moaning, calling out names of the people they think did this to them. Sometimes a few join up, and when they get all hard and crackly like old statues, they start to grow together, start to feel each other's pain. Sometimes there's mountains of them, entire landscapes of people crying about how unfair it all is. I'm still walking. But where are you going? I told you the center. I'm getting close now. All the clouds with their screaming faces are curving, all curving and being pulled in the same direction, twisting their way into the center. Please just stop walking and come back. Can't. No coming back. Besides, I have to keep moving like everyone else, doing something weird. It's the quickest way for the walkers to notice you. Oh God, what are the walkers? Started started seeing them more as I got towards the center. They're all over the place now. They're these things. Walk around on three legs like stilts, covered in sharp black shells like thorns. Remember the aquarium? They're kinds like those urchins we saw at the aquarium, but the top part, the main part, it's more exact, kinda arty, like a sculptor designed the shape. Reminds me of some kind of chess piece. When they notice you, they come over you, toppling towards you, but never falling over on those long legs. Spindly, yeah, that, what you'd say, they're spindly legs. And they stop, right over you, you're just between their legs and you see the holes underneath their main bit, and the tendrils come out. 
red windy tendrils with these itchy hairs come down and they start curling and swinging all around you. You almost don't mind at first because they're red. You've been seeing nothing but gray and black for years and the tendrils are red and it's beautiful but then they touch you, they touch you and it's awful. Every bad thing you've ever felt, every bad thing that ever happens to you start bubbling up to the surface drowning you all the pain that ever went into you rises up and out and the walkers feed on it. They lick it with their tendrils. They love the taste, the taste of all the things that shouldn't have happened. They love to taste the misery. Eventually they get full and move on and you, you get up and keep walking. Jesus, Dennis, Jesus. It's fine, they're bad, but you get a sense of perspective here. Sure, they're scary for you, but they're nothing next to the center. They're bottom feeders, moss that grew on the outskirts. If they're really like sea urchins, then the center, the center must be like a shark or a whale or some huge thing right at the bottom of the sea that's too big to come up near the surface. You've never said things like this before. I don't know how to describe it. When you're here, stuff just breaks down a little and you don't always need to have learned a word to know it. This place is less obsessed with causes and two plus two equaling four. Its job isn't to make sense. But what is its job? I don't know. Maybe I'll find out at the center. He went quiet again, and this time I wasn't sure I wanted to stop him drifting off. I wasn't sure I wanted to hear any more of this, but regardless of what I wanted, another groan soon creeped out of his mouth, and he was back. Shit, shit, I see it now, I see the center. His hand began to close, slowly but inevitably around mine, overcoming the rigor mortis to press in on my fingers like an iron vice. I kept trying to get out, almost yanking off the table, but I couldn't even budge inside the agonizing grip. It's inside, inside this huge thing like a beehive, floating above the ground. It's gray too, gray and covered with streaks and ridges like it was used to be liquid and hardened or it's like made of web or something. So big, Harry, I've never seen anything like it. All the clouds are swirling down into the hole at the top of it, still screaming. Hundreds of holes, messy, ragged holes, pitch black on the inside. It's bigger than cities, Harry, and everyone's heading towards it. Thousands and thousands swarming under it, pushing against each other to climb the bridges, messy bridges from the ground right up to the holes, right into the pitch black the center's in there, Harry. I'm here. Please, I said, whimpering with the pain in my hand. You can't go in. There's nothing good in that place. I knew this as a fact, not just because of the description, but as a gut feeling. I knew that what he was talking about was real and fundamental, as important a part of our existence as the sun and the moon and birth, but bad somehow, dripping with wrongness to its core. Where else is there to go? I'm at one of the bridges. Please, you can come back. No, that'd be like going back into the womb. Can't be done. This is what's next. Oh. What? Why? Oh God, I'm starting to feel something. I think the center's doing it. I'm getting bitter. Every mean, spiteful, everything angry thing in me, it's swelling spreading out and smothering the rest of me. I'm so mad, Harry. I'm getting so much smaller, and my hate is getting so much bigger. His hand tightened and I screamed. Why was it me? Why was it me and not you? What did you do that I didn't? What did I do that you didn't? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I said, fully in tears. His voice had changed. It was still quiet, but it was rabid. Each word growled and soaked with vitriol. I hate you. Do you know that? Still able to stand, still able to run, still able to breathe. I fucking hate you. I was hurting all the time and you just stood there feeling sorry for me. You couldn't feel any of it, just waiting to see me die so you could fuck off and do everything I never would. I was yelling and screaming for someone to come in and help. I'd almost pulled Dennis off the table, his torso hanging over the side, held straight by whatever force was allowing him to squeeze his hand. In all this, his eyes were still as dead as they'd always been. And then we went limp. His hand let go, his back sagged and he crashed to the floor. He'd broken three of my fingers, but shock was keeping it distant. I threw myself down onto my knees to see his face, slapping it and looking for any sign. He was still there. He gasped again, fainter than ever now. Oh no, oh Jesus. I'm inside and it's so much worse than I thought. It's beyond worse. It's so far past the worst I thought something could be. Please, Dennis, listen. Please tell me what's happening. It's the center. It's so big, big and floating above me. It's so much bigger than the hive, so much bigger than what it's inside. The whole inside is so much bigger, it's so big. It's gray too, always gray, gray and cracked like stone all over endless miles of it. His voice had changed, 
It was whiny and small and afraid. It's hurting me, Harry. It's hurting me more than I've ever been hurt and it hasn't even noticed me. Please, the man told me you need to describe it. He said if you kept talking, you might stay. So big, he said, his voice wobbling and breaking like he was crying. Its fingers are bigger than skyscrapers and it has so many fingers, millions and ribs. The body is all ribs or are they just fingers all folded up? I don't know. But there's so many and so big, Harry, and the masks, Jesus, the masks. What masks? The masks, its faces bigger than countries, all different. Some the eyes are perfect circles, others have huge pointy holes where the mouth should be. Some are blank, and some have eight eye holes, and some look like human faces, like perfect human faces, with deep, dark, hollow eyes. All of them, the inside of all of them is so dark, a living dark, a pulsing, dark pulsing all together, and it's so huge, so huge, and you can feel it pressing in on you, filling the air with badness and crushing down on you, and from inside you can feel the bad in you, reaching out to it, out to it, like a baby reaching out for its mom and Jesus Christ, Harry. He was breathing in and out faster and faster, shallow scared breaths, instincts overcoming the fact that he didn't need air. Dennis talked to me, what is it, what is it? It's not the devil. No, that's what I thought at first, but it's not. It's, it's more like God. It's like if God hated everything. His breathing hiked up again. Oh, Jesus, it sees me. Please, please promise me one thing. Just one thing, please. What, what is it? Please, don't ever die. One last breath rolled out of his mouth. I tried everything to get him back, everything I could think of in an animalistic burst of desperate energy. I hit him, shook him, pleaded, but he was really gone this time. I knelt there in the room for a while, his last words carving into a deep part of my mind I knew I could never dig them out of. The next few hours, in fact the next few days, were kind of a blur. I remember men in the Institute's white scrubs coming in and dragging me away from the body. I remember getting my hand seen to and put in a cast and sling. I remember Daniel Kowans sitting me down in a bright white room and interrogating me. He called it a conversation. But it was an interrogation, a warm interrogation by a man who could be kind if it meant getting what he wanted. He asked me if I'd had any visions or any strong sensations, if I thought Dennis was telling the truth, and if I could explain the ways in which Dennis was acting differently than he already was. I was detached and drowsy from exhaustion and trauma and pain from my hand and just answered honestly. At the end, Koanis made me memorize a phone number and sign a load of confidentiality forms, making it very clear that not a word of this could leave the hospital. I was to call if I started experiencing any phenomena I thought were related to my Dennis, and finally they left. My parents and I took a taxi home. We didn't talk about what had happened after Dennis died, and I suppose that even that was this secondary add-on to the simple fact that Dennis was now properly dead and not coming back. We went home, got to bed, and the next morning we had a wordless breakfast with an extra chair pulled out. The years flew by and the whole experience became something I just had to live with, some dreaded thing my thoughts would sometimes steer me back to, but mostly I managed to keep living, to accept it all as something. I couldn't understand. The fact that Dennis was gone was always worse than the way he went, however terrifying and unnatural it was. But lately I've been having a dream. It started off vague and incomplete, but every few nights it repeated, getting longer and more vivid. It always starts the same, with me and Dennis, both of us kids again, on a green hill on a bright, clear day, crisp air sighing past us. I can't remember most of the words, but the gist is that he's bragging, showing off, saying that Dad loves him more, that he's better than me, that he's going to keep being better for as long as he's alive. He's going to keep making Dad love him more for as long as he's able, and I get so mad, way madder than I'd ever have gotten if he said those things in real life. I see a rock, and without thinking I pick it up and attack him with it, knocking him over and beating him again and again until his skin was swollen and torn, and you would see parts of his skull underneath. He managed to push me off and run, and I followed, never thinking twice about it. I chase him so far until finally he runs into a pass between two mountains in a long, dark range that I somehow never see until that point. The range extends to either side, seemingly forever, and the sky above it is saturated with heavy dark clouds. It's like Mordor or something. I always stop running at this point, knowing that I've chased him far enough, the job is done, 
I start to leave my body, surging forward down the pass, no longer myself, just a nameless, thoughtless observer, gliding like a ghost for lack of legs. He runs down the dark pass, on and on, and into a sunless, barren country on the other side, a place where the soil is grey and dry. He runs for ages, but soon he stops, stops and falls and curses me, screams about how much he hates me and how much I cost him by driving him into this place. He rages for a long time. Then a second person comes, sometimes a man, sometimes a woman, sometimes old, sometimes young. They say they too were driven past the mountains, or that they wandered past them by mistake and can't get back over. Dennis always says the same thing, then let's suffer together, let's hurt together. And this person always latched onto Dennis, and Dennis latches back and they scream or cry and say they want to see people who wronged them skinned alive. And more always come, a trickle first, then a flood latching onto Dennis and the first person, all of them clasping together and piling up into a giant, deafening mass of squirming bodies, and eventually it's huge, almost up to the clouds. And then there's a rumbling, a massive shifting sound. The countless bodies start to rearrange, forming deep canyons of flesh that make up a horrendous, rage-filled outline of a face. There's a shift, greater than any earthquake the pile moves, rolling forward, pulling itself with enormous appendages, made of the miserable and the bitter and the despairing. It inches and tumbles on and on, crashing down and dragging itself onwards with overwhelming, apocalyptic sounds. And then I see that it's heading for the mountain range, it's heading back to the bright place, with all its anger and hate and vengeances. And as much as it's made of millions and millions of people, I always know, it's still one thing, one thing with one will, but all the hatreds of everyone buried in it, all the way back to the first one, the first one to curse, his rage still in there, rage directed at the first one to sin. It gets right up to the mountains. Then I wake up. I think something's coming, something that got started a long time ago, something that strips away good and builds itself on the bad, and I think it's almost strong enough to set out, to start moving, and I think when it gets here, the living will be no better off than the dead. When I was 16, my life changed forever. I had broken my back in a bad accident and was bedridden for months, unable to move. The pain was excruciating, but the psychological toll was even worse, being trapped in a hospital bed, staring at the same four walls day after day. But I was determined to recover and get my life back. As soon as the doctors cleared me, I decided I needed to get out into nature to truly heal my mind and body. My mum agreed that a camping trip down in the beautiful Devon countryside might be just what I needed. She dropped me off at a remote forested area with my tent, some supplies, and a portable charger to keep my phone powered up. I had scoped out what looked like the perfect isolated spot to set up camp. Sure, it seemed to be on private land, but it was getting late and I didn't want to risk camping too close to a public area. I quickly pitched the tent as darkness fell, cracked open a cider and fired up YouTube on my phone as I settled in to relax. That's when things took a turn for the sinister. I noticed my phone battery was draining faster than it should, even while charging. Strange, but I tried not to think too much of it. That's when I heard it, the unmistakable sound of heavy footsteps tramping through the underbrush, rapidly getting closer. My heart pounded. It sounded like at least 30 footfalls. Was it an aggressive hiker? Or worse, a property owner with a shotgun. In a panic, I unzipped the tent and stuck my hands up, preparing to face whoever was out there. But there was nothing. Just the eerie silence of the forest. The footsteps that had been nearly on top of me just seconds before simply faded into an unnatural nothingness. A deep sense of dread washed over me in that moment. Something was horribly wrong here. I turned my head slowly, my gut telling me I wasn't alone. And that's when I saw it, barely 20 feet away, unmoving yet undoubtedly alive, a massive skeletal beast around five feet tall, vaguely resembling a hairless emaciated dog. Its blank face was frozen in a permanent bestial snarl, lips pulled back to expose rows of jagged teeth. I've never felt such primal, wordless terror. Fight or flight didn't even enter into it, I instinctively scrambled backwards into the tent and zipped it up, curling into a tight ball on the floor. 
my mind had simply shut down, overloaded by the sight of that thing. After who knows how long, I somehow thought to check my phone in desperation. It was completely drained, so I frantically swapped in the portable charger. An agonizing 50 minutes crawled by before it finally turned back on, with just 3% battery remaining. With shaking hands, I managed to text my mum a frantic plea for help, dropping my location pin and a pre-arranged code phrase for an emergency extraction. The phone died again before she could respond. All I could do was hunker down in my sleeping bag and try not to imagine what sort of ungodly abomination was lurking just outside those thin nylon walls. The next few hours passed like a waking nightmare. Every minor sound, a snapping twig, a rustling bush, sent panicked visions through my mind of that towering bony creature closing in for the kill. Finally, I heard the blessed rumble of an engine in the distance. Risking a peek outside, I nearly collapsed with relief at the sight of my mum's car pulling up. I didn't even wait for the code response. I just grabbed my bag and sprinted straight for her open arms, leaving the tent and all my other belongings behind without a second thought. To this day, I have no rational explanation for what I encountered out in those woods. Maybe it was a delirious hallucination or vivid waking dream brought on by stress and fatigue. Maybe it was just an unfortunate trick of light and shadow playing on my already frayed nerves. All I know is that I've never felt such abject primal terror before or since. My body was robbed of all ability for rational thought or action. Only the most basic instincts for self-preservation remained. I'm not generally someone who believes in the supernatural, but that day in Devon will eternally be burned into my psyche as an omen. A warning from the universe that some places are better left undisturbed by human trespassers. If I had pressed on with my ill-fated camping excursion, I shudder to think what other shadowed monstrosities might have surfaced from the murky depths of that ancient woodland. Hello, my name is Mitch. I'm here to tell you guys about an experience I had. I don't know if it was paranormal or whatever stupid words people use to describe supernatural phenomena, but after that thing visited me, I believe in that paranormal trash now. A week after I moved in with my brother Edwin, after my house was foreclosed, I finished unpacking. Edwin liked the idea of me moving in, since we had not seen each other after 10 years, so I was excited too. I soon fell asleep after I moved in. After that one week, I heard rustling noises coming from outside at about one in the morning. I thought it was a raccoon, so I ignored and tried to fall asleep. The next morning, I told Edwin about it, and he agreed. The next night, however, I thought I heard my window opening and a loud thump as if something entered my room. I darted up and looked around my room, but I saw nothing. The next morning, Edwin dropped his coffee cup. When he saw me, he held up a nearby mirror and I saw myself. I had a large gash in my left cheek. After I was rushed to the hospital, my doctor told me that I must have been sleepwalking, but then he showed me something that made my blood turn cold. He lifted up my shirt to reveal a sewn-up incision where my kidneys were. I started in his eyes, my eyes widening. You somehow lost your left kidney last night. We don't know how, though. Sorry, Mitch. My doctor told me. The next night was my breaking point. Around midnight, I woke up to see a truly horrifying sight. I was staring face to face with a creature with a black hoodie and dark blue mask with no nose or mouth staring down at me. The thing that scared me the most was that it had no eyes, just empty black sockets. The creature also had some black substance dripping from its sockets. I grabbed the camera nearby on a mantle and took a picture. After the picture took, the creature lunged at me and tried to claw open my chest to get to my lungs. I stopped it by kicking it in the face. As I ran out of my room, I grabbed my wallet. I would need the money. I ran out of my brother's house into the night. I eventually ended up in the woods near Edwin's house and tripped on a rock. I fell unconscious and woke up in the hospital. My doctor entered the room, the same one who treated me before. I have good news and bad news, Mitch, my doctor started. The good news is that you had minor injuries and your parents are going to pick you up. I sighed with relief. The bad news is that your brother has been killed by some... thing. Sorry. My parents took me back to Edwin's house to collect my remaining belongings, which I did. 
Upon entering my room, I was scared, but remained calm. I grabbed my camera, then stopped dead in my tracks. In the hallway leading to my room, I saw Edwin's body and something small lying next to it. I picked up the small thing and entered my parents' car, not mentioning Edwin's corpse. I looked at the thing I had picked up and nearly vomited. I was holding my stolen half-eaten kidney with some black substance on it. As a child, I really loved playing the Sonic the Hedgehog games on the Sega Mega Drive. Sadly, when nostalgia hit me one evening, I found out our console broke when we moved house, meaning my mum threw out all of the old games. So I decided to search eBay for a pre-owned Mega Drive. I stumbled across one at the rather cheap price of £6, including delivery. The description claimed it also came with Sonic 1, yet on closer inspection, the cartridge's paper seemed to have been torn off with a label crudely placed on the front, written in a scrawled script. I thought nothing of it and decided to bid on it. Weirdly, despite it having a day to go, I immediately won the item. I proceeded to payment, left my feedback, and it arrived within three days. The Mega Drive was in surprisingly good condition for the price, almost brand new sand smudged fingerprints. I blew into the labeled cartridge, old habits die hard, you see, and inserted it into the cartridge slot. The TV screen flickered on, the familiar image of the Sega logo faded in left to right, but instead of the joyous chorus, there was a cacophonic blast of static which lasted far longer than it should have done. But this is where things got weirder. The title screen was polluted, black sludge pouring into the sea, with dark skies and lightning. The music was slower, in a dissonant minor key, and when Sonic popped out of the marquee, he looked genuinely terrified and afraid. I thought this must have been some sort of hack, until I hit start. I saw Robotnik, in graphics far more realistic than possible for the time, holding a lifelike rabbit by the ears. He looked full of malice and hatred, his pince-nez glasses glinting as he revealed in his other hand a machete. He held it up to the defenseless animal's throat and slit it, blood pouring out like a fountain. Robotnik began to laugh, but it was almost like he was in the room with me. It was so realistic. The game then went to Green Hill Zone, where the music was replaced with a low buzzing drone. The background looked just like it did on the title screen, and again, Sonic looked visibly shaken. His skin was paler, and he appeared to shake with fear. On running, he began to cry. Nevertheless, I decided to play through as normal, just to see if this was some sort of cruel joke. I ended up losing rings against a buzz bomber. The noise on losing my rings was a harsh ringing, and I heard Robotnik chortle once more, his face flashing in the stormy background. Sonic hit the floor. I was unable to control him at this point, as the buzz bomber began to descend on Sonic's helpless body. The buzz bomber literally stabbed Sonic, and all I could hear was tortured screams. I couldn't take my eyes off the crudely animated sprites of Sonic writhing in pain as the buzz bomber rammed into him. This went on for a good 30 seconds before the buzz bomber flew off, leaving a bloodied Sonic corpse behind. The screams subsided as the screen faded to black. I heard incredibly deep murmurings in some sort of weird language, maybe Japanese or Korean. Again, the hyper-realistic Dr. Robotnik faded into view again, but this time he was holding an even more realistic Sonic by the head. Sonic was crying, begging for mercy, sheer terror in his cries, but this time Robotnik didn't have a knife. He literally broke Sonic's neck, the sound reverberating, and I was treated to the sight of Robotnik kicking the defenseless corpse of the hedgehog around, blood flying everywhere, Sonic's spines breaking off, while all the time, the distorted sounds of Robotnik's laughter and Sonic's screaming played. A message appeared in Japanese with a selection, yes or no. I chose yes, somehow driven to continue. I appeared back in Green Hill Zone, but this time there were graves where the totem poles were. Sonic was even more afraid, looking directly at the screen, as if begging me not to continue. But I felt I had to. I continued through the game, of which its layout hadn't changed at all. The iconic loop-de-loop -loop was there, the tunnels Sonic span down, everything was the same, but decaying and full of pollution. I reached the end of the level, however, and it was the iconic boss level, you know, with the wrecking ball. Only when Robotnik appeared, there was a blast of loud, cacophonous synth sound. Robotnik's face was contorted with sheer disgust for the hedgehog. 
and before I even had a chance to attack, Robotnik's wrecking ball slammed into Sonic and crushed him against the side of the screen. Once more the screams played, but the screen began to glitch horrifically and turn grey, almost into television static. Before I had a chance to hit the power button and take out the cartridge, I heard very clearly in a deep voice, This was your fault, and your fault alone. I looked at the television, and the hyper-realistic Robotnik's face from before occupied the entire screen. The words Game Over flashed over his face as I saw Sonic's hyper-realistic carcass fall and land on top of the letters, sliding off and hitting the floor. All you could hear was Sonic whimpering and crying and asking, Why did you do this? Why? I promptly ripped the game out of the console and threw them both straight into the garbage. To this day, I have never seen that eBay seller online again. My computer returned 404s on searching in the history, and anyone I asked on the eBay forums claimed the user had never existed in the first place. Thank you for dropping by the archives and listening to our ghastly stories. Don't forget to like, comment, and lastly subscribe. Until next time, archivists, I bid you all good night.